Hi everyone, it's Nick, the Jaded Book Burner. I don't actually burn books, yet. And today I am finally bringing you my review of Frank Herbert's Dune. One of the most um, classic sci-fi novels and one of the most well-known. Um, I read this as part of my New Year's resolution to read classic sci-fi novels because I was reading so many new ones I wanted, and I wanted to know where all the originals came from. I also wanted to read this because, as you can tell by the little circle here, or you just for some reason have not been paying attention to social media or whatever, uh, there is a new movie coming out. It is not the first Dune movie. They did one back in the 1980s, and that one was questionable, not necessarily problematic, but questionable. Um, and then there was one in the early 2000s, a TV series, uh, Dune and the Children of Dune, uh, and I haven't seen that one. But anyway, so let's just go ahead and get started, because it took me a month to read this, about that much. But anyway... For those who don't know, uh, Dune is a, obviously, science fiction space opera, but it takes place in the very far future on the planet Arrakis, also known as Dune, where uh, Paul Atreides, a young man, 15 years old basically, um, and his family take over the planet Arrakis by order of the Emperor after the former Harkonnen family is ejected from it. However, as soon as they get there, there is already betrayal in their midst. Um, they're someone seeks to betray their family and once that betrayal is done paul and his mother lady jessica are thrown into the wilderness or the deserts of dune where they encounter the native inhabitants the fremen and how they work with them to get paul back to their home and reclaim it from the harkonnens all the while every single character has their ideals and philosophy put forward and then has those ideas and philosophy pulled up from underneath them. It is a book that discusses a bunch of things, has a lot of ideas. Not all of it has aged well, and I will go into that in a bit. But it, it was overall a mostly enjoyable experience. And if there wasn't something I didn't enjoy, then I respected it. So, um, first of all, let me just get to the fruit of the matter, core of the matter. Um, why it took me so long to read this, other than its chunky length, like, this book is thick. Um, even when it was originally written, I believe, uh, Frank Herbert and the publishers were a bit worried that no one would read it because of how long it took to, is it, binding it, whatever, um, how long it took to, um, produce and stuff like that, but anyway, uh, the dialogue is one of the primary issues. Um, as Daniel Green said in his review, the dialogue is a bit strange. Like, it's stilted at some points, and even there's one point early in the novel where the main antagonist, uh, Baron Harkonnen, is talking with an ally of his, uh, Peter, Piter, Peter, something like that, um, who's a Mentat. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, basically, Mentats in this world are human... Like, there's no computers in this world. Um, after an uh, ancient event known as the Butlerian Jihad, they got rid of thinking machines and computers, and they made Mentads, which are basically, as far as I know, only men who basically, since birth, they are trained to have knowledge of everything. But anyway, Peter the Mentad is speaking with Baron Harkonnen, and it sounded, and they were like discussing death, murder, and colonialism, and it was very cartoonish talk. Like, Peter's like, oh, it's so devilishly evil kind of thing. But um, that was part of it. Um, not all the dialogue in the book is bad. Um, Paul's dialogue is pretty good. Lady Jessica's, it wavers. Um, Leah Kynes is pretty good, but everyone else, it was just kind of, it was just so weird. And again, um, like I did with my Addie LaRue... <laughs> Addie LaRue review, um, I've got my Goodreads review up because I, it's been a while since I've read this and posted that review and I just need a brief refresher. Oh yeah, the main thing about this book, which is especially misunderstood by people who have never even read it, is people think it's a hero's journey. That Paul is some sort of messiah. When uh, Paul and Lady Jessica join the Fremen, they start calling him Muadib, which is like a little... Um, sand mouse that exists 
a lot of them start to a lot of the Fremen start to see him as their like messiah kind of the savior of their religion um and the Bene Gesserit, which we'll go into them a bit more, uh, the Bene Gesserit are this order of psychic women who have manipulated a lot of events in the history of the Dune world, and Lady Jessica Paul's mother is one of them. And there's, um, thank God, a, a terminology list in the back, as you can see. Um, the Bene Gesserit, they call Paul the... Where? Turn the page. Uh, the Equisets Hadarach, shortening of the way. Um, basically, all the Bennett Jesuit are all women, but the male one, the you know Equisets Hadarach, I'm probably just pronounced that completely different. Um, was a male Bennett Jesuit that could bridge time and space and all that, and that ends up being Paul. No surprise. Um. And there is kind of this messianic legend to that part as well, and the Quisset Haderach or whatever fits in kind of with the Fremen Messiah. Um, we learn that the Bene Gesserit planted the Fremen religion centuries ago on Dune, and the legend with the Quisset Haderach. And the reason they did that was to manipulate the populace and stuff like that. And But still... Paul, at first, is acknowledged or painted to be that messianic Quisak Hedorak or Fremen savior. But like I said, it is not a hero's journey. It is actually a very slow and gradual descent into uh, villainy, tyranny, or evil, I would say. Um, even Frank Herbert himself said, this whole book is a warning about hero worship. Like, Paul literally kind of manipulates the Fremen into doing things for him. And he doesn't treat them cruelly, but he does, like, change some of their cultural practices, which, um, again, I'll go and There's a lot I need to go into, but... in a bit. But, um, basically, he does just kind of manipulate them via their religion. And the thing is, Lady Jessica, his mother, you know, planned to manipulate the religion just so she could use it to control the Fremen, but it blows up in her face because... She didn't want Paul to be an actual messiah, you know, maybe use the archetype of it to, you know, get their way forward and back to regaining their home. But he does become the messiah in a way and takes seriously the religious underpinnings of it and it kind of blows up in her face. The whole point of Paul actually, other than being not a true hero, is that he undoes all of the different characters' philosophies. Like, um, one of the other, um, central philosophies of the book is, um, oops, uh, la 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 la, it's this argument between emotions and logic, which has been present since forever, and it's a bit gendered, but, um, where did you go, where did you go, where did you go, cotton on Joe? Another character in the book is, uh, weapons master Gurney. Um, he's a very logical person, and he's often at odds with Lady Jessica, Paul's mother, because she's very emotional. Again, it's kind of gendered. Um, he is so logical, though, that he fails to account for human emotions involved in their actions and reasons for doing stuff within the book. Because the Baron Harkonnen is very much driven by his emotions, even if he wouldn't admit it. And Paul is kind of an emotional kid, too. On the other hand, Lady Jessica is so emotional that right when the betrayer, Dr. Yue, um, is about, he's literally about ready to crack under the pressure and guilt of what he's about to do, but she just tells him to relax and go away. So the argument of logic versus emotion is kind of turned on its head with Paul and the story as well, because both Lady Jessica and Gurney completely just, you know, fail by their own reasoning, but also because Paul is both a logical kid and an emotional kid. He's kind of like this almost equal balance. So, again, Paul undoes that completely. Like, the whole book is just based around people believing in a certain ideal, and then it falls apart. In fact, one of the most prominent scenes in the book is with Liet Kynes, I believe that's his name. 
He's the father of Chani, um, Paul's love interest, and he is the ecologist for the Atreides family, for the Empire on Arrakis, and I believe he is part Fremen as well, and as well as living among them. After the Atreides family gets attacked by the Harkonnens, um, Liet Kynes is thrown into the desert without a still suit, which still suits are these suits which, you know, help people survive in the desert. Um, and he starts hallucinating about his father, the previous ecologist. And one of the things, and this is a very, this was a scene that shook me. Um, one of the things that the hallucinations of Liet Kynes' father tells him is he keeps talking about the environment, about how people wish to terraform Arrakis and take it from a desert planet into this lush green planet of running water with, or with more water. And then he tells Liet Kynes right before he dies via the explosion of a spice mound that him supporting Paul was the worst thing he could do. That making Paul into a hero was one of the worst things he could do. And that it is a terrible thing that will happen to the Fremen. That was both a turning point in the book and kind of the lights going off saying this isn't a good thing. And the talks of the environment, and again, it's something that I had not seen in a sci-fi novel, even in modern sci-fi, is that Lee Kine's father was talking about how we take for granted the environment in our world and how it affects not only the people, but also the culture, the military, the religion, stuff like that. The environment has an effect on people, where you live, what kind of, envir kind of environment, and people fail to realize that. Arrakis itself is almost a character within the book and how it controls people in a way. Not only through the spice, which, um, for those who don't know, the spice called melange? Melange? Yeah, melange. Um, basically this super important spice that powers a whole bunch of things in the universe, but... Um, even the spice, the sand, the sand worms, they are almost characters or extension of the character of the planet Arrakis itself in Dune. And it's got everybody under this spell. So that was very interesting and almost apocalyptic in a way. And I mean apocalyptic, not, not as an end of the world, but as in revelation-like, uh, re revealing-like, um little mini Greek lesson, apocalypse, means just a reveal, you know. Anyway, so um, the book just, it had so many things set up, then it just subverted them. And it talked about things that I did not even expect. But, like I said, some parts of this haven't aged well. And I um, have already gone over the dialogue, um... But now, let me discuss the betrayal of women and then colonialism. The women in Dune are not terrible representations. Um, it's not an outright misogynistic book, but again, like I said with the whole logic versus emotion argument, it's a bit gendered. Lady Jessica herself, you know, represents the emotional part. You know, that whole argument that men are more logical and men, women are more emotional, that. The one interesting thing about Dune is that um, if you do ever read it, at the beginning of each chapter, there are these little, um, I think these are called epigraphs, I'm not sure, but little bits of historical information clearly written after the events of Dune that were written by um, the Princess Irulan, or Erulan. And she's the daughter of the emperor, and at the end of the book, uh, Paul takes her as a wife, a symbolic wife. He's still in love with Chani. Um, and the fact that she's, like, the one that's chronicling this or narrating this is very interesting. Usually, in books like this, it's usually a male narrator or author years later. She's a very omniscient person from those little tidbits. Um... And she is a Bene Gesserit as well, like Lady Jessica. A lot of the women in this, except for Chani, are Bene Gesserits. And um, Lady Jessica herself was okay. Um, like, 
she she could certainly outsmart a lot of the men. Like she outsmarted Stilgar, one of the Fremen men, who um, were a bit like, not against her, but terrified of her Bene Gesserit abilities or mistrustful of her. She outsmarted Gurney, um, but she became very over emotional at times. Again, the emotion thing, and. She seemed like a very stereotype motherly figure, you know, constantly worried over her son. It, like, she's still very smart, and I think according to Brian Herbert, the son of Frank Herbert, um, Lady Jessica is based off Frank Herbert's wife. So, I don't think Herbert meant it with a malicious interpretation, obviously. But, you know, it's still, she still feels, Lady Jessica still feels like just, you know... She's not the worst female character, but she's not the best. Uh, Chani, uh, who is Paul's Fremen lover, she was kind of there. She didn't have a lot going on for her. Like, she was certainly a motivational person for Paul, but she didn't really do so much. She was just kind of there. And then there is Alia, or Alia, um, who is Paul's sister, who is born in the third out of the third act of the book, um, Lady Jessica discovers that she's pregnant with her, like, in, like, the middle-ish part of the book, and, um, she's a bit dismayed because, as a Bene Gesserit, she was supposed to give birth to a daughter to let her join the Bene Gesserit order, like, mothers and daughters constantly, constantly join the Bene Gesserit order, and she didn't find out until later that she was pregnant with her, and then when her and Paul... Hala, her and Paul are a part of the Fremen group. She drinks the waters of life, which causes Aaliyah when she is born, not only to have the blue eyes that all the Fremen have, but to be very omniscient, very, like, she's way more mature. She can form coherent sentences more. Aaliyah, though, was conceptually the most interesting character, or female character. Maybe she's also the most conceptually interesting character in, overall, but she was innocent yet calculating, and fun fact, in the original draft, uh, Frank Herbert killed her off, but um, I think it was Joseph Campbell um, told him not to. Was it Joseph Campbell or John Campbell? Um, but So I'm glad he didn't kill her off. And then, finally, when it comes to the Women of Dune, we have the Bene Gesserit. As I said, the Bene Gesserit is an order of women, the psychic-powered women, who are sometimes viewed as being witches, um, who have controlled a lot of events in the world of Dune. Um, they were based off the Catholic ants and Jesuit nuns, um, because uh, Jesuit is derived from the word Jesuit of Frank Herbert's childhood. They made a breeding program to, you know, birth the most... Powerful male child, the uh, again the Quisak Hatterach, and they believe that to be Paul, or they fit him into the archetype of the Quisak Hatterach, and they've also become concubines for various rulers. Again, Lady Jessica, the mother of Paul, was a concubine for Duke Leto, his father. Again, Princess Irulan was destined to become a concubine at some point, but she becomes Paul's wife, um, which is another thing that was subverted. Paul took. Chani, a Fremen girl, as his concubine, and took a Bene Gesserit as his wife, but um, it's purely symbolic. But even Princess Irulan, her mother, was also a Bene Gesserit. And they were, are responsible for so many things in the universe. Like I said, centuries ago, they planted the religion on Arrakis so that years later they could manipulate the populace um, to anything they needed. And... And... The booktube goddess discussed this as well. It is kind of sexist. Like, again, the book never says outright that women are all evil. But why is this all order of this, you know, order of all women so completely hell-bent on, you know, manipulating things in the universe? Why? Why? And to be fair, there are a lot of evil and corrupt men in Dune. The Emperor is pretty much corrupt. The Baron Harkonnen is corrupt. Like, the main driving, you know, besides the Bene Gesserit, the main driving forces of this novel are power-hungry or corrupt men who want everything to be their way. And I guess maybe Frank Herbert was just trying to say that regardless of gender, people can be manipulative and corrupt. I don't know. It's just that... I 
Again, I don't know what to think of the Bene Gesserit. They are a very interesting order of women, but why this whole order of women is just... And again, I'm not deriding this book as complete misogynistic diatribe. Again, it is a product of the 60s that doesn't excuse what it says. And I don't think Herbert saw himself as a misogynist or whatever. And I'm not saying you shouldn't read this book because of how the Bene Gesserit or other women are in it. Please read it just to get your own thoughts. But again, the Bene Gesserit, it just, they make me scratch my head. I like them, but the reasons for them being kind of evil is maybe a touch sexist. I'm not sure. And finally, the colonial aspects of Dune. Dune is actually kind of aware, self-aware about this part. I'm not saying that Frank Herbert was a secret, you know, our woke king who knew about white supremacist, um, colonialist world, stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's clear that the Empire, the Emperor, and the Baron Hrunkonen did not treat the Fremen inhabitants very well the Fremen who are indigenous to Arrakis. And it kind of said the Fremen had every right to hate, you know, outsiders off-worlds of the planet. Like, they had every right to distrust Paul and Lady Jessica initially. And it, again, didn't shy away from the Bene Gesserit manipulating the Fremen's religion to control them. And again, th this goes back to Liet Kynes' death, you know, Paul, an off-worlder, being their hero, is not good for them. However, the noble savage stereotype. Um, if you don't know what that is, the noble savage is um, a colonialist, imperialist, kind of racist archetype where the indigenous people are wild and unkempt and are primitive, but they're still a good people with a credo. Um, I believe Thomas Jefferson used that to describe certain Native American groups. Um, the noble savage archetype does kind of pop up now and again throughout this book. Their religion is viewed as regressive and superstitious, so therefore they're, you know, savages in a sense. And even Chani at one point, she's known, shown to be a strong and intellectual girl, but they say that's a product of her Fremen upbringing of not being, you know, like Lady Jessica, kind of pampered, and just growing up in that harsh environment. It got close, but yet, so far. This is a thought-provoking book. I do want to point that out. And I gave ultimately gave it four out of five stars. I don't know if I'll read the rest of the books in the series. Um, you can read this standalone. You know, you can. But, again, I don't know. Like, there are parts of this that haven't aged well, but they're not terrible. Um... And right now I'm reading The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Robert Heinlein, and that has aged worse. Review of that coming soon when I get done. But Dune actually turned out to be not half bad. Um, again, still some problems with it. I would really recommend if you want to see a book that, you know, does have a good descent into villainy or evil, because there are so many books out there that are lacking that, and when they... Um, when a book does come around offering that, it kind of skips out. Looking at you, Girl Serpent Thorn. Um, sorry. Um, but, you know, again, not everything has aged well. The women in it are, mm -hmm, you know, it's not the worst, but it could have been better. Colonial aspects, again, got close, but just slipped up on that noble savage stuff. Again, there's never any outright racist descriptions or st stuff going on in this. But, um... If you, when you notice it, you notice it. Uh, again, the noble savage stuff. So, I do recommend that you read Dune. Not just because it's a classic, but just so you could also get your own thoughts of it. And also, in case you want to see the movie coming out uh, later this year, I believe, that you know what's going on and whatnot. Um, so, that is it for my review of Dune. I hope you enjoyed. If you liked what you see, hit subscribe, ring that bell. And thank you for watching. Hope so this book has not been burned. <laughs> Who knows? I might burn another one later. Not serious. Not serious.